This is a video of Rene Bollinger's paper, The Pragmatics of Slurs. This paper is a very technical paper in the philosophy of language, so I will pause at various points to explain some of what's going on here. Uh, her, and so here she provides an abstract. I argue that the offense generation pattern of slurring terms parallels that of impoliteness behaviors and is best explained by appeal to similar, purely pragmatic mechanisms. In choosing to use a slurring term rather than its neutral counterpart, the speaker signals that she endorses the term and its associations. Such an endorsement warrants offense, and consequently slurs generate offense whenever a speaker's use demonstrates a contrastive preference for the slurring term. Since this explanation comes at low theoretical cost and imposes few constraints on an account of the semantics of slurs, this suggests that we should not require semantic accounts to provide an independent explanation of the offense profile. So that is the point that she's going to talk about here. She's contrasting semantic meaning versus the pragmatics of the use of language. And recall, semantics is what does the word mean in its systematic sense? How is it used by the community? Uh, what does a competent speaker of the language know about the word that contributes to the truth conditions of what is said? Pragmatics is, what is the individual speaker doing when they do something with this word, when they use this word? And uh, again, the classic contrast is, if you ask the question, uh, could you pass the salt? Semantically, you are just asking a question, but pragmatically, you're conveying your interest in someone's ability to move the salt, and therefore suggesting to them that perhaps them moving the salt might be of your interest, and therefore perhaps indirectly making a request. And so what Bollinger is going to do here is that she's going to argue that uh, some accounts of the meanings of slurs have focused on the semantics. What is the meaning of the slur? How do we explain some of the features of its meaning? And she's trying to do something different. She's trying to say, why do people get offended when you use the slurs? And of course, on some level, that's uh, a simple question to answer. If the meaning of the slur is offensive, that's one reason why people get offended. But she's trying to say that uh, there's various semantic theories that don't quite account for all of the uh, features of offense generation. And being offended is, of course, only one of the things that happens with slurs. It's different from being pejorative. The speaker might be pejorative to someone without anyone being offended. Or conversely, someone might be offended even though the speaker was not being pejorative to anyone. And thinking about how and why that happens can help us understand uh, what are all the things that are going on when people use these words or don't use them. Okay, so she says, when we use slurs, we communicate information about ourselves and our attitudes towards the targets. Recognizing this obvious fact requires no great insight, but taking it seriously yields a simple and remarkably powerful explanation of how and why slurs generate offense. Recent discussion of slurs has centered on their offense generation pattern, characterized by phenomena that cluster into roughly five properties. And of course, different authors here have enumerated slightly different lists of these properties, but she's going to focus on these five. Offensive autonomy. Slurs are offensive even when the speaker does not intend the use to be derogatory. Embedding failure. The offensiveness of slurs projects out of various forms of embedding, including indirect reports, negation, and mentions. She's going to give examples of this, but just to think about it, uh, if someone uses a slur and you want to report what happened, you don't just want to say, Bob said, and then quote him fully, because if you quote him fully, you'll be saying the slur yourself. And it's odd, but people often get offended when you quote someone as using a slur. Or if someone uses a slur and says, all Chinese people are and uses a derogatory term, and then you say, no, Chinese people are not, and then you use the derogatory term yourself. Again, there's something potentially offensive in using the term again, even though you're negating it. And that's sort of a bit of a mystery. It's why does that happen in a way that it doesn't happen with many other words, certain other things don't go along when you quote or when you negate. Whereas with slurs, some of the offensiveness is there even under these conditions. So this, this is what she's calling embedding failure. Perspective dependence. Use of a slur is taken to indicate that the speaker holds derogatory attitudes. 
offensive variation. Not all slurs, even if co-referential, appear to be equally offensive. And here, the thing to note is that it's particularly obvious with outdated slurs like limey for British people. Um, that is mildly offensive, but not nearly as offensive as the slurs that are still current. And slurs like the N-word are much more offensive than uh, other slurs that exist currently. Insulation. Despite all of the above, slurring terms can occasionally occur inoffensively, and this is true even of particularly potent terms. And she's going to give more examples about this, but perhaps the classic example would be in a dictionary. If the Oxford English Dictionary really aims to list every single word in the language, they will include the slurs. And you might think it's not offensive for the dictionary to include the slur, as long as they're careful about exactly what they say about it. And so it's not that the word is magical and it is automatically offensive every single time it is ever pronounced or written out. But uh, there is something about what's going on here. And explaining exactly what this pattern is, is the point of this paper. With some notable exceptions, the dominant strategy thus far has been to try to construct a semantics thick enough to account for this offensive profile, and in turn, to take doing so as an adequacy condition on semantic theories. That is, the point is, many people have tried to explain the meanings of the slurs in such a way that those meanings can explain why all five of these features hold. And she's going to suggest the meaning by itself doesn't have to uh, explain all five of these things. She is going to accept that the meaning should explain much of this, but she's going to show how pragmatic factors also explain some of what's going on here. Kroom appears to take offensiveness to be an indicator of derogation. So while he is primarily interested in explaining the derogatory aspect of slurs, he evaluates the success of his account by its ability to generate the right offense profile. Hedger frames his project of extending Kaplan semantics straightforwardly as an attempt to account for the offense profile of slurs. Hom motivates his externalist semantics primarily by needing to account for offensive autonomy and variation, features with which, which Williamson and Whiting aim to capture semantically with conventional implicature, and Jeshin explains by appeal to a semantic rule of use. Kennedy offers a radically contextualist picture in order to account for variation, insulation, and the offensiveness of mere mentions. Potts, Saka, Richard, Boisvert, McCready, and Gutzman each give to varying degrees expressivist semantics to explain embedding failures and perspective dependence. Okay, so this discussion, she just referred to a lot of papers in this literature. As you can see, philosophers of language and, uh, and linguists have written a lot about slurs in the past decade or two. And uh, she's just summarizing what a lot of this literature says. Some of what her summaries are saying make a lot of sense to someone who's already deep in the language, the literature and philosophy of language and linguistics. So understanding exactly what Kaplan semantics or externalist semantics or conventional implicature or radical contextualism or expressivism, these are all technical terms in the philosophy of language that have specific meanings and that are trying to do slightly different things to explain what's going on with the meaning of slurs. And you don't have to understand any or all of those points in order to understand the main points of this paper. But for professional philosophers who are reading this paper, seeing that passage can help situate what is Bollinger trying to do that is different from what these other authors are trying to do. And she's also indicating that she's read this stuff and she's not duplicating what they're saying. Though there is plenty of work to be done in the semantics, slurs conditions of application, connection to stereotypes and relation to neutral counterparts are all promising topics, I argue that it is a mistake to hold our semantics hostage to offensiveness. So that is, she's saying, there is a lot to say about the semantics of slurs. What is it that makes it correct or incorrect, true or false to use a slur? Presumably they're usually false or incorrect, but uh, what is the theory that is behind the use that would make it correct? How does it connect to stereotypes? Hom says that slurs express the stereotypes. Other people might say different things about its relation. And some people say that slurs literally mean just the same thing as a neutral counterpart, and it's purely pragmatic, the difference, whereas others say they express the neutral counterpart as well as something about the stereotype. Others say, no, they do something else. They're maybe not in any way connected to the neutral's counterpart. 
But she's saying that whatever's going on with the slurs, offensiveness is a, is a feature that can be separated from being pejorative or being derogatory, and that the offensiveness, she thinks, is going to be explained pragmatically. The characteristics of the offense profile can be accounted for by a highly general, purely pragmatic process compatible with most theories of the semantics of slurs. This paper has three complementary but separable aims. First, to establish that slurs and other offensive speech acts pattern together, and so should receive parallel explanation. Second, to develop and offer the contrastive choice account as the best explanation. And finally, to illustrate the explanatory power and generality of such a pragmatic account. Uh, that is, she's going to say that slurs have some features in common with various other forms of impolite or offensive language, and she's going to try to find a way of explaining all of them. And she suggests this will explain certain interesting and puzzling features about the debate about slurs that has gone on. In developing this account, I make two key assumptions. A, slurring terms are marked as the dispreferred option for achieving reference to the target group. B, they are associated with the derogation of their targets. And some of this might be not obvious, but some of it is technical vocabulary. Dispreferred versus preferred is a term that linguists use very often. And marked versus unmarked is also a term that linguists use very often. And the idea is that uh, there are certain terms that are the default ones that we tend to use, and others that are marked that stand out in one way or another. And uh, some terms are the ones that we prefer, others are the ones that we disprefer. And again, linguists use all this even in just discussion, discussing relatively neutral things about nouns and verbs and so on, but uh, uh, it is going to have obvious applications here. A is relatively innocuous requiring only that competent users of the language be aware that slurring terms are not polite, a typical requirement for competency with respect to slurring terms. That puts it very mildly. <laughs> B intentionally leaves open the question of whether this association is achieved semantically or otherwise. So that is, uh, she's not going to take a stand on whether being derogatory is part of the literal meaning of the slurring term, I think most authors in this literature do think that it is, and she is happy with that thought. But there are, there's a minority of authors in here who argue that the literal meaning of the term does not include derogation. And so she's going to show how her account is compatible with either of those views. She's going to explain why it's offensive to use the slurs, even if the derogation is not part of the literal meaning, but rather something else. Most robust theories of the semantics of slurs address themselves to this question, that is whether slurs are literally derogatory. And it is a virtue of this account that it is neutral between the various ways of specifying the nature of this association. And here's the footnote. Some semantic theories maintain that slurs express negative stereotypes. Uh, Chris Hom and Lynn Terrell say that, or it expresses negative attitudes. Chris Potts says that. Some say that it doesn't literally express those things, but it conventionally implicates derogatory attitudes or contents. And that's Timothy Williamson and Jennifer Whiting. Or maybe it semantically encodes contempt, perhaps via a rule, a rule of use. And this is what Robin Jeshin says. Or it represents the target as contemptible. This is what Mark Richard says, and perhaps many other inferentialist accounts. These conditions can also be met by minimalist or primarily pragmatic theories, such as the one advocated by Jeff Nunberg. Okay, again, you don't need to know the details of all those things. You can look them up. If you get the actual paper, you can see its bibliography and find all of these papers if you want to read and learn more about what philosophers of language and linguists think about the meanings of slurs. And also, if you look through those papers, they investigate a lot of cases and they show how complicated the, uh, the topic really is, but they also show what can be done systematically to talk about these things. And part of what's going on is that all of these people are committed to the idea that there's something systematic to be said about this. Language isn't just a mess with each person making it all up as they go along. All of us learn the meanings of language in a systematic way, combine it using systematic rules, and interpret each other with these, uh, these systematic rules that we don't make explicit, but we implicitly already understand. And again, this all goes back to the idea that 
uh, almost every sentence that you ever say or you ever hear is one that has never been said before and will never be said again, and yet people manage to understand each other. And so something systematic has to be going on to explain how that's possible. And note that the same thing happens with slurs. People recognize when they're offensive and recognize some of these other features when they happen. In the process of developing this account, it will be necessary to mention a number of potent slurs. And note that when she says mention, she's contrasting mention with use. This is a contrast that philosophers have talked about throughout the 20th century, that sometimes you use a word when you're talking, but sometimes when you're quoting someone else, you are mentioning the word, but you are not yourself using it. And, uh, uh, and she notes that with slurs, even mentioning them often generates some of the offense. I have tried to keep this to a minimum, using the terms directly only where required to elicit clear judgments or give illuminating examples. And ju that's just to note, this is a warning. The terms do come up, not as much in some of the, as in some of the other papers in this literature, but they are there. So uh, if you've ever been a target of these terms, you might want to make sure that you're well-fed, well-rested in an emotionally happy place when you're reading this paper. The status of the slurs mentioned in academic work is an interesting question. So in section 5.4.2, I trace the implications of my account for such occurrences. And this is an interesting thing that she does. She is explicitly considering the question, what should philosophers be doing when philosophers talk about this? Because the words come up when you're talking about this and not just if you're a racist out in the wild. Section one sets up some necessary preliminaries by examining the nature of the offense the account attempts to explain. Section two reviews the central data to be accommodated concerning the offense generation patterns of slurring terms. And section three examines some parallel data for impolite and rude speech. In section four, I develop and apply the contrastive choice account to explain this data. Section five summarizes the account's ability to explain the target pattern of offense generation. Finally, section six showcases the theory's predictive power in generality by extending it to explain the insulation pattern of slurs which occur within works of fiction and theater. That is, in section six, she's going to consider two prominent recent movies that both featured very extensive use of certain racial slurs, and she's going to explain why it is that one of them came in for a lot of cultural criticism about that use of slurs, while the other one did not even though the use is similarly extensive in both cases. And she claims her account can show why. Okay, section one, preliminaries. Warranted, rational, and actual offense. In saying that an utterance is offensive, there are three distinct claims we might be making. That some hearer actually took offense, or that the utterance warranted offense, whether or not any was taken or that regardless of whether offense was in fact warranted, it was rational for a hearer to take offense. Each of these bears some unpacking. But the basic idea is she's going to say, sometimes people get offended. Sometimes the attitude of the speaker is such that people should be offended, whether or not they got offended. And sometimes whether or not the speaker's attitude was such, it was reasonable for the hearer to believe that the speaker's attitude was such, so that they were rational to be offended. And she notes these are three separate things and we have to be careful about the distinction between them because sometimes it wasn't warranted offense, but it was rational because the speaker didn't have the attitude, but the hearer had no way of knowing that. Or sometimes the speaker did have the attitude, but the hearer shouldn't have thought they did. And sometimes people take offense when there is no offense that's either warranted or rational. And sometimes people fail to take offense when the offense is warranted and rational. So all of these are different things, and she's going to discuss this a bit more. Actual offense depends on a hearer's interpretation of the utterance and is neither necessary nor sufficient for either warranted or rational offense. An utterance may warrant, but fail to actually generate offense merely because either there is no hearer or the hearer fails to find the utterance offensive, perhaps because the hearer shares the offensive attitude or fails to take it seriously, or misinterprets the utterance. So those are three reasons why someone might not take offense, even though it was warranted. 
Similarly, mistakes concerning, concerning the semantic content, that is, what did the word mean? Someone might have heard the word and not realized what it meant. Or the speaker's illocutionary intent, that is, maybe someone thought that the speaker was just quoting someone else, didn't realize that the speaker was actually saying it. Or the pragmatic mechanisms activated by the utterance may result in a hearer taking unwarranted offense. Uh, so these are cases for unwarranted offense. So maybe uh, the uh, speaker didn't realize, or the hearer didn't realize that the speaker was quoting and thought the speaker was actually saying it. Or the hearer thought the speaker was saying something else rather than the thing they did say. Not every such mistake is unreasonable, though all result in a mismatch between the offense taken and what was warranted. For instance, hearers may naturally take offense when a speaker uses the N-word to refer to them. That's an understatement. Discovering that the speaker was ignorant of the word's derogatory nature should make us think that their offense was in some sense, in fact, unwarranted, but nevertheless, the hearers were not irrational or responding inappropriately to what they heard and taking offense. So that would have to be something like, I guess I could imagine some non-native English speaker who uh, has picked up English from reading 19th century literature might use the N-word without realizing just how offensive it is. It's hard for me to imagine what's going on there, but something like that could occur. And in that case, the hero would be rational to take offense, even if it turns out it was unwarranted because the speaker just really didn't know what's going on with that word. Since hearers may be subject to a variety of sources of uncertainty concerning the level and degree to which offense is warranted, e.g. they may be unable to discern a speaker's intentions or might be unfamiliar with the term used, let us use expected value of W for the offense the hearer has reason to believe is warranted given her evidence. So here expected value is, this is a term that comes up from Bayesian epistemology and decision theory that involves probabilities uh, where you don't know what exactly is going on in the speaker's head, but there's a bunch of things that might be going on. And maybe you think two thirds chance this person doesn't know what's going on and just picked up this word from 19th century literature, but one third chance they do know what's going on and they mean it. In that case, the expected value of how offensive it is, is about a third of how offensive you would think it would be if the person really intended it. And, uh, and so she's not going to do any of these probabilistic calculations, but that's where this term expected value comes from. In what follows, I will use rational or licensed to indicate when the hearers are epistemically justified in taking offense, that is on the basis of the information they have, and reserve warranted for morally justified offense, and that is on the basis of what's actually going on in the speaker's head and how uh, bad the speaker is being. So warrant is about what's going on on the speaker side. Rationality is about what's going on on the hearer side. That is at least in this paper for Bollinger. Offense may be disproportionate either by taking more offense than is warranted or by failing to take offense when warranted. On the assumption that rational hearers ought to proportion their offense to the severity of the offensive action, adjusted for their confidence that the action in fact occurred, we may say that a level of offense is rational when it is appropriate given the hearer's evidence. Though warranted offense is the primary focus of the paper, the notion of rational offense helps clarify some of the murkier intuitive data and will equip us to evaluate the contrastive choice accounts predictions of actual offense patterns insofar as they are rational. Of course, some people will not be rational. Some people will irrationally fail to be offended. Some people will irrationally be offended. But Bollinger's main idea is that most people are being roughly rational in their offense patterns. And we can explain what's going on, why they are more offended in some cases, less offended in others, by thinking about all of these things that are going on. OK, 1.2, grounds for offense. One more set of distinctions will prove useful in the discussion to follow. There are three identifiable grounds on which an utterance may warrant offense. Intention, inappropriateness, and its associations. 
utterances may be and often are offensive on multiple grounds simultaneously. When intending to offend, speakers commonly select tabooed insults or slurs to communicate their ire, but the severity of the offense warranted varies with the grounds for offense. So that is, she's pointing out, you can intend something offensive, you can say something inappropriate, and you can do something that has offensive associations. And uh, so you can intend offense, even, or you can intend something negative while being perfectly appropriate. And very much uh, many types of witty put downs are often exactly that, uh, that you are really deeply offending someone while being sure to say it all in a very polite way. Or you could be using deeply inappropriate words like swearing a lot at a kindergarten. But if you're doing so in a way that is not intending any harm, that's a different sort of offense. Uh, so utterances that violate a taboo warrant offense in virtue of their inappropriateness. This is going to depend on what that taboo is. Most common expletives, vulgarities, and general pejoratives warrant offense of this type. And here in the footnote, she explains what these are. Expletives are words generally used in outbursts, such as damn. That is, these are words that have no part of speech. There's not, they're not a noun, they're not a verb, they're not an adjective. It's just a thing you say to express something. Many expletives are taboo in many circumstances. Vulgarities involve tabooed bodily references. Shit, fuck, and ass are all vulgarities. General pejoratives are insults used to condemn a particular person as opposed to a group for behavior at a given time. Asshole, idiot, and prick are prime examples. And notice that these have different taboo patterns, but they're all taboo in certain ways that you don't call someone an idiot in certain circumstances. I refer interested readers to Beller for an analysis of general pejoratives and Hay for a careful dis discussion of the systematic differences between slurs and general pejoratives. The distinction is occasionally clouded by terms like the B word, which have both a slurring and a general pejorative use. So think about that. Some people use that word in a way that is derogatory to women, and some uses of that word are not gendered in some way, although I think it's very hard to take those two apart to fully understand what's going on. Nunberg examined some such crossover slurs, explaining how a slur can drift into use as a general pejorative and vice versa. OK, inappropriateness on its own, so that is things like using a vulgarity in a place where that's inappropriate. This grounds only a relatively shallow level of offense, such as that caused by a child trying out the word fuck for the first time at the dinner table. And it is nearly always compounded with intent or associations. So that is, most of the time, when someone says something inappropriate and it's offensive, a, a, a significant part of the offense is not just the inappropriateness, but also what the person intended or what else was associated with it. And uh, here, footnote nine, Anderson and Lepore, who have a couple papers on this, they should be happy to allow this since on their account, the institution of a taboo subsequently associates the use of the tabooed term with flagrant disregard for the wishes of the targeted community. And this disregard does the heavy lifting in their explanation of slurs offensiveness. So they're talking about slurs. I don't know the details of their account, but basically what Bollinger is saying is going on is that the mere fact of saying a curse word in a place where a curse word is taboo causes only a minor level of offense. But if you say the curse word in a place where it's taboo, and then someone points out that it's taboo, and then you continue doing it anyway, you have then revealed another further intention to continue violating that taboo. And that generates extra offense beyond the mere offense of generating the taboo. And just as another example of this, if you step on someone's toe, that's a bad thing. You shouldn't have done it. But people generally don't take too much offense at you having stepped on their toe if you do it once. But if you keep stepping on their toe over and over again, then they'll take very strong offense and with good reason. And so there, it's the difference between doing the thing that was inappropriate, stepping on someone's toe or saying this word, and showing that you have this bad intention. 
Speaker intent is the most general warrant for offense. Any phrase may be used to offend if the intention to do so is clear. And just think about any example from Grice where he says, where even just saying someone has good handwriting can be extremely offensive if you're doing so in a context where you're supposed to say the nicest thing that you can imagine about a person. Saying that, if, saying that they have good handwriting is suggesting there's nothing else nice about this person. That's very offensive, even if, strictly speaking, what you said is nice. However, this speaker intent is inadequate as a full explanation of the offensiveness of slurs, since it cannot explain why a slur offends despite a speaker's good intentions. For that, we must appeal to the terms offensive associations. Associational offense, so this is one I haven't talked too much about yet, this exhibits huge variation dependent on the severity of the association. Terms, phrases, or symbols that are closely associated with abhorrent attitudes or practices warrant the sort of deep offense commonly exhibited by slurs. The symbols of a swastika or a burning cross belong to this category, as do terms that have come to be associated with various forms of racism, sexism, or more generally with a threatening program of discrimination against members of some group targeted by the term. And notice the swastika, that word swastika comes from Sanskrit because that symbol is just a traditional symbol of the sun, I believe in a certain Hindu religion. Uh, but in the West, that symbol has come to be so strongly associated with the Nazi regime and its genocide that, uh, that the symbol is now offensive just by that association, even if uh, you're, uh, you're only intending to use it in a representation of uh, uh, traditional Hindu practices. Now, maybe within a Hindu temple, it'll still be insulated, but you wouldn't want to wear some of that in, uh, in other uh, places in the West. Elements of this category are often the subject of hate crime legislation and singled out for their power to provoke their targets. So this is the sort of thing that in France and Germany, it is illegal to own Nazi memorabilia. It is not necessary that such terms be associated with or backed by formal social institutions, though they often are, just so long as there is an adequately visible practice associated with the terms. Okay, section two, the offense generation profile of slurs. Before attempting to explain it, we should briefly recount the data constitutive of slurs odd embedding pattern, specifically insulation and the various cases of embedding failure. And recall, insulation is that there are sometimes cases in which you can mention a slur without being offensive, but embedding failure is that there are plenty of contexts in which you uh, mere mention of the slur is offensive, even though there's some level of grammatical indirection that would normally be taken to dis distance the speaker from a word in that position. Okay, 2.1, insulation. The least controversial inoffensive occurrences of slurring terms are cases where the terms are only mentioned. And again, mentioned is contrasted with used. In direct quotation, or when some contextual constraint leaves the speaker with no alternative to mentioning an offensive term, for instance, a hearer might insist, tell me exactly what he said. In that case, if the person answers and uses the slur because they're quoting someone else, the offensiveness of the term remains embedded in the original context. Our indignation, if it is aroused, is directed at the individual whose utterance is being quoted rather than the current speaker. And now as a footnote, Quotative occurrences of the N-word and the C-word are an exception in some high profile cases where the author is typically subject to criticism for failing to use an available circumlocution such as quote the N-word or C-word. This exception to the rule is instructive and I'll return to it in section five. That is she's noting, even in places where you're instructed to quote someone, for some of these words, we have a standard name for the word other than the word itself. And so even if someone asks you to you say exactly what the person said, you can say it without saying the word yourself. And that's an interesting point that she'll come back to. Okay, similarly, when a slurring term T is mentioned in a dictionary entry, perhaps in the following form, 
T is a derogatory term for R, often associated with or implying F. We do not feel tempted to censure the dictionary compiler for tokening the term. And here, tokening the term means putting the term in words in, on the page. Often, we would feel uh, tempted to uh, criticize people for even quoting a racial slur, but a dictionary we wouldn't uh, criticize for including the racial slur. I guess maybe if it's a children's dictionary that's not intended to be a full record of the language, but in something like the Oxford English Dictionary that is intended to be a full record of the language, including the term is not grounds for criticism. Now in footnote 12, she notes, Hima discusses a case where a dictionary was censured for the definition of the N-word, but the details of the case suggest that it was the apparent endorsement of the term rather than its simple occurrence that caused the offense. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 1998 gave the following as the first definition. They just defined it, the N-word, as a Black person, usually taken to be offensive. That is, they didn't say the word is offensive, they just said it's usually taken to be offensive. This definition was interpreted by many, including the NAACP, as endorsing the application of the slur to African Americans. If someone just read that definition, they would think, this is a word that you can use to describe Black people. Some people might think you're offensive. The problem was not that the noisome word appeared in the dictionary. It was that the definition labeled me and anyone else who happened to be Black or have dark skin, an N-word. The N-word needs a more accurate first definition reflecting that it is a derogatory term used to dehumanize or oppress a group or race of people. The proposed solution, which Abraham suggested would resolve what she and the NAACP found offensive, is not to refrain from even mentioning the term. Instead, it is to expressly acknowledge and label it as derogatory, perhaps by updating the definition to something like this. A derogatory term for a black person, usually taken to be offensive. D2 instances a docile occurrence. The term is mentioned, but not even implicitly endorsed, and consequently the entry is inoffensive, despite tokening the slurring term. Even mentioning several slurring terms in rapid succession does not necessarily warrant deep offense. Some theorists dispute this possibility. Anderson and Lepore contend that the sentence, the N-word is a derogatory term, is offensive. So they would likely reject my suggestion that dictionary cases are docile. I haven't read the Anderson and Lepore paper, but uh, I suspect there might be some subtlety to their view, maybe not in the dictionary, but in some cases. But now Bollinger says, consider a hypothetical corporate memo advising employees that they must abide by a strict anti-slurring policy. Memo, the following terms are not to be used by any corp employee nor is there used to be tolerated in any corp classroom or workspace. And then it starts listing a whole bunch of slurs. It is doubtful that anyone would protest that the slurs as they occur in the memo are as offensive as they would be if they were simply used. So at least to some extent, mentioning slurring terms successfully insulates their offense potential. Perhaps you think as I do, that there is still something strange or offensive about listing each of the slurs explicitly rather than giving a blanket admonition to avoid slurring terms. If so, that suggests that something other than a simple use mention distinction is at work in mitigating, though not entirely neutralizing, the offensive potential of these terms. The positive account offered later in the paper may be able to explain this residual discomfort. And so we'll get there eventually, but her point is, it's not just the fact that something appears in quotes as a quote of something that you shouldn't say that makes it inoffensive. Because these are much less offensive than actually saying them, but not completely inoffensive if the corporation were to issue this memo that explicitly listed all these words. Okay, section 2.2, embedding failure, perspective dependence, and offensive autonomy. Insulation is neither unique to slurs nor especially puzzling on its own. Embedding failure is a more interesting property, showcasing instances where slurs license offense despite forms of logical embedding. These contexts often simultaneously exhibit offensive autonomy and perspective dependence. 2.2.1, negations and denials. Aside from cases of metalinguistic denial, 
which I'll explain in a moment. Speakers cannot distance themselves from the offensiveness of a slur simply by denying a slurring predication, as speaker B does in quote one, or embedding it under negation, as in two. So quote one, speaker A says, Henrik is a kraut. Speaker B says, no, he isn't. The point is, speaker B hasn't fully distanced themselves from the offensiveness of the slur. They've just said, Henrik isn't. Sentence two, Henrik is not a kraut. And here, uh, footnote 14, utterances of the form, Henrik is not a kraut, no one is, are metalinguistic comments on the range or permissibility of the term kraut rather than denials in the standard sense. So that is, at least sometimes when you, uh, when you say deny something, you're not denying that the property holds, you're denying the word. So uh, for instance, someone might say, this isn't good, it's great. Normally, this isn't good means something is not good. But saying this isn't good, it's great, is saying good is not the appropriate word to use for this. So it's metalinguistic. You're talking about the word, about the language. And she's saying, at least sometimes, people are talking about a word and when they negate. And in those cases, maybe you've fully insulated yourself, or at least largely insulated yourself from the offensiveness of the word. But if you're not doing that, if you're just denying the property of a particular person, then you're not eliminating the offensiveness. As she says, speaker B's unspecified denial in one is by default a denial of speaker A's implication that Henry is German. The offensiveness of the slur kraut remains, and this is so even if the speaker bears no ill will towards Germans. For note 15, the difficulty with negating or denying the offensive content of slurring terms has been well and widely observed. And then she cites more places with detailed analysis. Far from being rendered docile, the occurrence of the slurring term in two suggests that the speaker embraces the practice of calling, classifying, and referring to Germans by using the slur kraut and is only disputing Henrik's nationality. I think another interpretation someone might have of these cases is they might be denying the appropriateness of using this term for all Germans and just saying Henrik isn't that kind of German. Either way, there's still a lot of offense that one could take if this term kraut is taken offensively. 2.2.2, indirect reports, conditionals, and modals. So these are three more cases where embedding a term often distances yourself from it, but not for slurs. Ordinarily, when content is embedded under a conditional or indirect speech report, the speaker is not held directly responsible for the embedded attitudes. So. Again, some technical vocabulary there. Conditional is a sentence of the form, if this, then that. An indirect speech report is when you say, when you don't quote someone, but you say, you describe what someone said, you paraphrase them. And so when you put something inside a conditional or when you paraphrase what someone said, often you, uh, you distance yourself from it. So you say, uh, for instance, if someone says, uh, if you want me to, I'll be there for you tomorrow. They're not saying they'll be there for you tomorrow. They're just saying, if you want them to, they will. And so they haven't fully committed themselves to it. Uh, similarly, a doctor might say, if those spots turn red, that's a really bad sign. The doctor's not saying it's a bad sign. They're just saying, if something happens, then it is. Uh, similarly, if you quote, if you paraphrase someone, Bob said that was a really bad sign. You're not saying it. It might be, Bob said that was a really bad sign, but I don't believe Bob. However, as she says, slurs are an exception. The offensiveness of slurs is not insulated by embedding them in indirect reports, and in nearly all cases, also fails to embed under conditional construction. Sentence three. Bob said he'll fire all the cunts. Someone who says that is not fully di uh, distancing themselves from what Bob said. This person seems to be someone endorsing it. Sentence four, if I were racist, I probably wouldn't like N-words. Uh, and uh, uh, sentence five, 
a less enlightened man than myself, a cruder man than myself, a man less sensitized to the qualities and charms of women. Not me, but a man like that just might call her a C-word. The speaker of sentence five is rightly censured despite the counterfactual construction. And this is quoted from The Wire, season one, episode five. And uh, this line is spoken by McNulty in reference to his ex-wife. And Detective Kima Greggs is quick to criticize him for calling the mother of his children a C-word. And uh, so, of course, in these cases, this sort of construction looks like you're not saying it, and yet we still find it equally offensive. The occurrence of the slur in three and four suggests that the speaker is racist or sexist, despite the conditional construction of four, and even though three is an indirect report. And I guess five in, includes both. It's got this conditional and quotative uh, aspect. Okay, section three, a parallel phenomenon, rudeness. So she's going to talk about how the offensiveness of slurs is like rudeness of other things. The motivation for giving a thick semantics for slurring terms is a desire to accommodate this curious embedding pattern. And thick here just means it's got lots of layers to it, lots of features that are going on more so than ordinary words, together with the other features comprising slurs offense profile. It stands to reason then that we have at least prima facie justification to expect the right explanation to generalize to any other offense generating terms with the same offense profile. While slurs are a particularly clear case, they are not the only offensive expressions to exhibit the five features of interest. Rude and impolite expressions generate a remarkably similar, though typically less severe, pattern of offense. Absent a good argument in favor of treating slurs as sui generis, that is of their own kind, sui is their own, generous is kind, or of a kind, uh, a good argument in favor of treating slurs as sui generis, absent a good argument in favor of treating slurs as sui generis among offensive expressions, the account we use to explain the offensiveness of slurs should generalize to rude expressions and vice versa. 3.1, the five features, redux, that is revisiting them. Chris Potts gives a careful discussion of rude terms, vulgarities, expletives, or general pejoratives noting that the expl expletives and general pejoratives are perspective dependent. The attitudes conveyed by the expressions are assumed to be the speakers. So six, Herman believes that Hella's damn dog is dead. Seven, Sue believes that that bastard Kresge should be fired. In both of those cases, people assume that the negative attitude belongs to the speaker of six or the speaker of seven, rather than to Herman or to Sue, even though damn or bastard is inside the someone believes that. And here in, sex, in sentence seven, she even gives, Sue believes that that bastard Cresby should be fired and considers this follow-up. I think he's a good guy. That hashtag symbol in front of it is a, term, is a symbol that linguists often use. They, they have a bunch of symbols for marking which sentences they're quoting that seem good and which ones that seem bad. An unmarked sentence is considered to seem good an asterisk in front of a sentence usually means it's grammatically incorrect. I would never say that. Um, a hashtag in front means it's grammatically correct, but it doesn't make any sense in this context. So here they're saying, Sue believes that that bastard Kresge should be fired, but I think he's a good guy. And that seems like a really weird thing to say, because why would you say Sue believes that that bastard Kresge should be fired if you think he's a good guy? you wouldn't use that bastard Kresge. So six conveys that the speaker of this sentence holds Hella's dog in low regard. And the continuation in seven is infelicitous precisely because the earlier perspective, according to which Kresge is a bastard, is assumed to be the speaker's. Angelica Kratzer points out that with enough priming, we can get pejoratives like the ones in nine, uh, which I guess we haven't seen yet, uh, to attach to a perspective other than the speakers. But these contexts are quite difficult to evoke and are at best unclear whose perspective is being expressed. So that is, in, I think maybe that was a mistake for seven. In sentence seven, Sue believes that that bastard Kresge should be fired. If you set that up with enough background, 
Sue is constantly calling him that bastard Kresge. I'm just going to quote Sue. Sue believes that that bastard Kresge should be fired. If I say that, maybe I'm not uh, uh, endorsing that expression, but we need a lot of buildup for that. By default, this word is taken to express my uh, into, uh, feelings and not just the feelings of the person who uh, is mentioned earlier in the sentence. Rude speech is perspective dependent, even when the expression used is unmarked and impolite or rude only due to contextual features. So here's the example uh, that is unmarked and contextual features of impoliteness, she's going to say, for example, though addressing someone by a formal name or title is appropriate when the addressee and speaker are not on familiar ter terms, when directed at a lover, this form of address insults the hearer. That is, if, uh, uh, if you're a customer service representative, it would be fine to say, okay, Mr. Smith, uh, can you tell me what the problem is? Whereas if you're addressing your boyfriend and you say, okay, Mr. Smith, can you tell me what the problem is? You are distancing yourself from your boyfriend by calling him Mr. Smith. The insult is immediate and is assumed to reflect the perspective of the speaker, since by using a form of address appropriate to distant and formal relationships, rather than one appropriate to close personal relationships, the speaker gives the hearer warrant to believe that the speaker considers their relationship to more closely resemble the former than the latter. Of course, there's a little bit of play with this, that uh, I definitely have friends who sometimes address their spouse as uh, Mr. So-and-so or Dr. So-and-so as a way to joke around with this form of expression, but, uh, but it's clearly joking and that clearly relies on the multiple levels of uh, distance, appropriateness, formalness, informalness, markedness, and unmarkedness of the expressions. Addressing someone as Mr. So-and-so is unmarked when you're talking to a stranger, but it is very marked when you're talking to a friend. And, uh, uh, and so it's drawing attention to itself in these different ways. Rude expressions also exhibit embedding failure in conditionals and indirect speech reports. In sentence eight, the speaker appears to endorse the appropriateness of the description of all this as shit, even though he ascribes it to Bob. And if we're offended by that, the offense is not lessened by the embedding. Eight, Bob said he was done with all this shit. Nine, if he doesn't shut up, that motherfucker is going to get a ticket. Similar comments apply to the general pejorative in nine, despite its conditional construction. So in both of these cases, the speaker of the sentence is the one who is using this shit or that motherfucker. It's not just being attributed to the other person unless you literally put it in quotation marks. Unsurprisingly, rude expressions also possess offensive autonomy. They cannot be rendered inert just by a speaker's ignorance or assurance, assurances that she means no offense or even actual absence of offensive intent. In ordinary contexts, an utterance of you motherfucker signals aggressive rudeness, a signal that cannot be canceled by simply appending no offense or I don't mean to be rude. Even if the speaker is unaware that the expression is marked as rude and employed it only to express generalized frustration, that fact does little or nothing to reduce the rational offense licensed by the utterance. That is, even if I use that term all the time to talk to my friends, if you don't know that, you would be perfectly reasonable in thinking I was being offensive by calling you a motherfucker. Similarly, speaker intent exacerbates, but is not necessary for offensiveness. It is possible to be offensively rude or impolite without even being aware that you've done so. Nevertheless, in specialized contexts, the expressions can be successfully insulated. In familiar informal interactions where all parties are aware that normal signaling relations are suspended and the speaker intends no rudeness, the very same expression, you motherfucker, can be used to signal intimacy rather than rudeness. Finally, and perhaps most obviously, there is considerable variation in the level of offense licensed by different rude expressions. Formulas associated merely with disrespect, e.g. that moron, nutcase, idiot, 
are less offensive and tend to be less inflammatory than those associated with aggression. You motherfucker, cocksucker, goddamn idiot. I'm not entirely sure what the difference is here between the ones that are associated with disrespect rather than aggression, but there's definitely something about the associations of these, that some of these are associated with milder uh, circumstances, some of them are associated with more aggressive circumstances. Given these parallels, we have strong reason to want our account of the offensiveness of slurs to parallel our story for rude speech. This provides not just a constraint on theory selection, it also suggests where to go looking for a promising account. 3.2, accounting for rudeness, co-occurrence expectations. Though they use different terminology, theorists explaining impoliteness have primarily focused on accounting for offensive autonomy, variation, and insulation. Those are three of the features that she's mentioned for slurs. Recent work on these three aspects of the offense profile of impolite behavior has converged on pragmatic explanations invoking the contrast between a speaker's chosen performance and her relevant alternatives. That is, you said one word, even though other words were possible. And the contrast between this word and the other words is what's doing the offense, not this word itself, but the contrast between the options. I'll briefly gloss the work of two such theorists to draw out the structural similarities of their accounts, then argue that they illuminate a deeper connective thread, which explains not only the features of interest to impoliteness research, but can be generalized to explain all five aspects of the offense profile of both impolite behavior and slurs. And furthermore, allows us to predict when offense will occur if rational. Marina Terakurafi, offers a frame-based account according to which expressions are associated with politeness or impoliteness in virtue of the regular co-occurrence of particular types of contexts and these particular linguistic expressions. For note 25, a frame is a holistic representation of a context type which tracks co-occurrence of linguistic expressions on the one hand, and on the other hand, a variety of non-linguistic elements including social contingencies, speaker's intent, and the setting and history of the interaction. To put that more understandably, uh, a frame is so holistic representation of a context type. That is, we are somehow understanding a bunch of contexts, uh, a bunch of types of word situations in which you might use words. And it tracks co-occurrence of things, that it, is it tracks which things are attached to which other things. So uh, here, it's an association of linguistic expressions with non-linguistic elements. So that is, some words are used with in some circumstances, and other words are used in other circumstances. Some words are used by speakers with one intent, other words are used by speakers with a different intent. And uh, uh, some words are used in one setting, other words are used in another setting. So that is a frame somehow is this set of images or representations or whatever that the users of the language have in their mind that tells them which words are associated with which intentions, which words are associated with which types of people, which words are associated with which types of context and so on. And of course, none of this is formally taught to people or formally represented but we all have something like this going on in our head. And she says, co-occurrence expectations, that is the ex expectations of the hearer between who uses this word and who has which thoughts, arise from regularities between non-linguistic features of a context type and displayed preference for a particular expression over a semantically equivalent alternative. And if you just want to think about any other sort of word, uh, think about what expectations you have about what words are appropriate to use in papers and what words are appropriate to use in ordinary conversation. I find that there's a certain type of student paper that often uses a lot of big words or fancy words because the student has developed this association between big and fancy words and academic writing and hasn't necessarily developed the more subtle association of which words go with particular meanings but the students still have this association of uh, 
the words with context and try to use the one word in one context and the other word in another context. And the idea is we're all doing that all the time with all the words we hear. And so we have these expectations about which words are used by people with one set of thoughts about something, which words are used by different people with different thoughts about that thing. Statistical regularity of co-occurrence with polite contexts associates an expression with politeness. That is, if there's a certain word that you constantly hear in polite contexts and you never hear in impolite, in maybe more familiar contexts, and there's another word that you hear in one set of contexts but never in the really polite contexts, then you associate the expression with politeness. And then once we all associate the term with politeness, this has the result that displaying preference for this term becomes a conventionalized signal of politeness. That is, once we've all associated a term with being more polite, we know that one way to signal that you're being polite is to specifically choose to use that term. And once we recognize that people are doing that, this becomes a convention. It's conventionalized. And the same analysis holds for rudeness, mutatis mutandis, where that is changing all the things that need to be changed to rudeness instead of politeness. Default frames for a context are generally minimally polite. That is, they're the lowest level of politeness that is consistent with the context. So any expression that deviates from that, either impolite or overly polite, is a marked alternative. Use of a marked expression signals that the default frame does not fit the actual context. And use of a conventionalized signal activates the frame for the expression's associated context type. That is, when you find yourself in a conversation with someone, there's a default set of expectations about what sort of words you expect them to use. You have other words that you've categorized as less polite than this context, and other words you've categorized as more polite than this context. If a person starts using one of those sets of words, you will tend to assume they are trying to signal to you that they think this context is a more polite one or a less polite one. And that if they signal some one of these things, that's going to change your attitudes about politeness and, and of course, taking offense can occur because of either sort of direction. That someone who insists that this conversation is more polite than you thought it was is sort of distancing themselves from you. While someone who insists that this context is less polite than the one you thought is drawing themselves unwantedly close, perhaps. Turkurafi glosses conventionalized signals as sitting halfway between pragmatic purely inferential conversational implicatures and semanticized conventional implicatures. That is, conversational implicatures, remember, are these things that are generated based on what everyone involved thinks is going on in the conversation and what they assume about what's going on in each other's heads because they've noticed that someone made this particular choice. Conventional implicatures, on the other hand, are things where certain words just automatically signal certain contrasts, even though it's not literally part of the meaning. And this is what Grice says is going on with the word but versus and, that the word but signals a contrast, even though it doesn't literally say that there's a contrast. Um, so these conventionalized signals work to compress inferences in a way structurally similar to Bach and Harnish's notion of standardization. And unlike conventional implicatures, these signals can be canceled or blocked in special contexts where one or more of the steps in the compressed inference are blocked. Unlike conversational implicators, conventionalized signal content cannot be unilaterally ca canceled by the speaker in ordinary contexts. Rude behavior grounds offense when the behavior or expression is associated with rudeness in the context type, and this is generally well known in the relevant linguistic community. Jonathan Culpepper notes that while politeness is conventionalized by statistical frequency of co-occurrence, impoliteness is less direct. What counts as impolite in the context is less a matter of the conventionalized meaning of the expression used and more about the speaker's choice to flout the contextual politeness expectations. So that is, using a word that's more polite just automatically signals that you think it's more polite, but He's suggesting that using a word that's less polite is showing that the person thinks something 
I'm not entirely sure I'm getting this full distinction here, but uh, I think the important thing is words are associated with types of attitudes. When you hear someone use a certain word, you naturally think that they have those attitudes. And often once everyone knows that certain words are associated with certain attitudes, Cho intentionally choosing the word can be a way to show people that you have that attitude. Two conditions must be satisfied for impolite behavior to warrant offense in a context. The selected expression must contrast negatively with the expected or default be behavior for the context. And this fact must be generally well known among members of the linguistic community. When these two conditions are met, the speaker's choice to flout expectations signals a lack of concern for the face or social standing of the recipient who is licensed to take offense to the signaled attitude. Section four, the contrastive choice account. Turkurafi and Culpepper apply their accounts to explain why rude or impolite behavior is both somewhat stable, exhibits offensive autonomy, and interestingly context dependent, exhibits offensive variation and insulation. Though they invoke different specific mechanisms, the structure is the same. The offensiveness of impolite or rude behavior results from content signaled by the speaker's decision to perform that particular behavior rather than a comparatively polite alternative. Viewed at this level of abstraction, it is easy to see how to generalize this structure to give a unified account of all five features of the offense profile of both impolite behaviors and slurs. The type of signaling invoked in the impoliteness account is one instance of a broader signaling phenomenon present whenever parties to an interaction face a free choice between referentially equivalent expressions. Free choice means there's no rule forcing you to choose one rather than the other. Referentially equivalent means two words for the same thing. Signaling on this framework is factive. A speaker signals some content phi when her use of an expression satisfies the conditions, regardless of whether she intended to communicate phi and independent of whether hearer uptake occurs. So what Bollinger is saying with that sentence is that signaling in this sense is actually like Grice's natural meaning, not like Grice's non-natural meaning. Remember, Grice says non-natural meaning is when the speaker intends that the hearer recognize the intent, whereas natural meaning is when there's just something that is in fact correlated with the thing in question. So smoke signals fire, regardless of whether anyone intends it to signal fire, and regardless of whether anyone recognizes it to signal fire. It is correlated with fire, and, uh, uh, and so that causes this signal. And Bollinger is going to suggest that much of your choice of language is going to signal features about yourself, regardless of whether you intend it and regardless of whether anyone recognizes it. OK, section 4.1, signaling and contrastive choice. Speakers competent with a language have knowledge not only of lexical items and grammar, but also a set of co-occurrence expectations that encode the social norms and conventions concerning the use of various terms and ways of speaking. So that is co-occurrence again here is, when does this word occur in people with this attitude? Or when does this word occur in context where this is going on? So at their most general, such expectations are the form the behavior alpha characteristically signals phi. So smoke characteristically signals fire. Or uh, saying the n-word characteristically signals racism. So phi can range over any associated information. The possible values for phi exhibit substantial variety, ranging from endorsement of attitudes to membership in a group. The signal content of a choice is not determined directly by the patterns of use. Whether and how strongly alpha signals phi depends on the strength of the association between choosing alpha and endorsing phi. Strong correlations and patterns of use is a natural way for such an association to come about, but is not the only one. I won't bother with that footnote. I think it's dealing with an issue that isn't really a terribly significant one. For signals based in contrast of choice, the relevant behavior is the free selection of a marked expression 
and performance signals that the speaker endorses a cluster of attitudes associated with the term, or more precisely, a high probability that the speaker shares some or all of the attitudes in this cluster. And here she cites Skirms. I'll give a link in the description to some of Skirms' work. He has a lot on stuff on signaling. But he says, signaling relations between an expression alpha and some associated content phi naturally emerge when the correlation between preferring alpha and endorsing phi is sufficiently strong and stable. As a result, signaled content rarely attaches to the default or the unmarked term, since the signal will be swamped by noise. So that is, if there's two terms that are available, one of which is common and one of which is uncommon, the common one will occur in all sorts of people in all sorts of contexts, but the uncommon one will only occur sometimes. And people will learn to notice the patterns about the uncommon one more than they'll notice the patterns about the common one. And so the uncommon one will become marked as signaling a particular association. And you can think about that with all sorts of cultural signals, not just words, but also hairstyles, types of clothing, fashion choices, uh, uh, ways of eating your food, whatever it is. All of these things can signal features about yourself and the uncommon ones will generally be strong signals while the common ones will generally be weak signals. For signals based in contrast of choice, the relevant behavior is there. Oh yes, so more formally, when some content phi, when it is common knowledge in the linguistic community that one, alpha is an expression for psi associated with phi, and beta is an expression for psi not associated with phi, then in situations where the choice of expression is not forced and the speaker is aware of one and two, selecting an alpha, alpha in contrast to beta signals that the speaker endorses or shares phi. So that is, if you know there are two different ways you can say a word, there are two different words you can use for a certain uh, thing, or there's two different types of clothing you could wear. There's two different types of hairstyle you could have. And if you know that one of them is associated with one thing and one of them is not, then if you choose to do the one that's associated with the thing, you're at least signaling that uh, you endorse that thing, whether it's through your words or through your other choices about yourself. The information content of signals based in contrast of choice is linked to how marked the term is. If alpha is a term that is used almost exclusively by speakers who embrace phi, and this fact is well known, then a contrast of preference for alpha is a high information signal, raising the probability of the speakers endorsing phi nearly to one. Footnote 34, the information carried by a signal is measured by how much it alters the relevant probabilities. A high information signal alters the probabilities quite a lot, while low information signals have a much more limited effect. The more well-known the association between alpha and phi is, the higher the information content of the signal, and thus the more strongly the contrastive choice signals the speaker's endorsement of phi. For example, in polite contexts, the expression old lady is associated with rudeness toward and disrespect for the social standing of the referent. Consequently, when in such a context, a speaker chooses to refer to his mother using the expression, my old lady, rather than my mom or my mother, he signals that he endorses or holds such an attitude of disrespect towards her. Since this is an offensive attitude, his contrastive preference for the rude expression warrants offense in the context. This pattern extends beyond expressive or evaluative terms. For instance, since use of the term cisgender is limited almost exclusively to members or allies of the trans community, a speaker's selection of the term strongly signals that the speaker is sympathetic to the community's project of undermining the associate, assumed synonymy between normal and non-trans experience. This information is not part of the semantic meaning of cisgender, nor can it be convincingly glossed as a conventional implicature of the term. Rather, the signaling relationship results from the particularly low probability of freely selecting the term while failing to hold such an attitude. So that is, since people don't normally talk about the concept of being cisgender unless they are aware of and care about the trans communities, the fact that someone uses that word is a signal that others can reliably use to predict this person probably does know and care about people in that community. And I'll notice there's something interesting about this example. The vocabulary she's using here, cisgendered, 
and trans star rather than cisgender and trans, uh, that vocabulary was considered a bit more common maybe five or six years ago than it is now. And, uh, and so this is signaling her position at a particular point in time in the development of the modern trans rights movement. And so I think that's an interesting thing to note that sometimes the effects of these signals can change very quickly. Uh, and uh, uh, you can think about exactly what other sorts of terms you've heard about whose association with one group or another may have changed in recent years. 4.2, contrastive choice and warranted offense. So how does this mechanism account for the behavior of slurs? We've assumed that slurs are known to be dysphemistic, negatively marked by any speakers competent with the terms and are associated with the derogation of their targets. It is also a characteristic that for any slurring term, there is some available alternative expression for the same target class. Where phi is the derogation or oppression of the class of people, offense is warranted when a speaker endorses phi. Use of a slur alpha rather than a neutral alternative beta is a defeasible indicator that the speaker endorses phi, but can be undercut by speaker ignorance or a forced choice. So that is, we all know that for all these slurs, there's both the slurring word and the non-slurring word. Everyone knows that the slurring word is at least associated with derogatory attitudes towards the target class. Furthermore, everyone legitimately takes offense when someone expresses derogatory attitude towards someone. So when a person chooses to use the slur rather than the non-slur, they're indicating their this association with the, uh, with the derogatory attitude. And thus they are warranting offense because they're aware of this. So their choice to do so is a choice that they make knowing the consequences that they will be assumed to be derogating. And since, so that means it's warranted and it'll be rational for the hearer to take offense because it's reasonable to believe that the speaker has done this, but it's defeasible. It's only because the person has that choice. And if we know that the speaker doesn't have the choice, or it's only because the speaker knows that the term is associated with derogation. And if we know that the speaker doesn't know that, that might cancel us also. A choice is forced if something about the situation of utterance makes alternative expressions unavailable or inappropriate. And much of what she's going to talk about in the rest of the paper is some cases in which there, these choices really are forced. In such cases, utterances of alpha do not signal that the speaker has a preference for alpha or for beta, and so do not signal that this uh, speaker endorses phi. This does not apply that nothing offensive can occur in forced choice contexts. It is consistent with his account that hearers could hold the speaker innocent while finding the utterance derivatively offensive, insofar as it necessarily makes salient an original utterance that warranted offense. Ignorance is similarly undercutting. When a speaker is ignorant of the association between alpha and phi, her use of alpha does not signal that she endorses phi. If she is unaware of any alternatives to alpha, then whether her use warrants offense depends on whether if she had known of an alternative beta, she would have refrained from using alpha. So that is consider the example of the foreign speaker who just learned a 19th century term and doesn't know the existence of modern alternatives, then them choosing to use that term doesn't indicate that they chose not to use the modern term. It just might be that they're unaware of it. The model predicts that warranted offense is subject to one main source of variation, the nature of the attitudes in the cluster associated with the term. If a use of alpha is an endorsement of phi, then it warrants offense proportional to the severity of the attitudes in phi. Different slurring terms may be associated with clusters of negative attitudes of varying degrees, ranging from bare contempt to a willingness to desire to kill or inflict great suffering on the target, and may have mixed associations. Footnote 36. This association could result simply from observed correlations between using alpha and holding some attitude in phi. Signaling relations can emerge in this way, and specifying the association this way relieves us from having to clearly delimit the precise attitudes associated with a given slur. And to think about that, uh, some correlations might emerge initially just by accident, but once we've noticed a bit of a correlation, people will start signaling that way. And uh, uh, 
uh, you might notice that with all sorts of, I mean, this happens in the animal kingdom, that uh, certain colors of tails and so on uh, become signals of fitness just because there was some correlation, but then it takes on a life of its own. But it happens in human sociology as well. So the offense warranted by a slur is therefore sensitive to the tenor of the attitudes thereby endorsed. The more ambivalent or tempered, the lower the degree of warranted offense. My account has significant parallels to suggestions made by a number of others that the offensiveness of slurs depends in an important way on the speaker's word choice. Footnote 37, this suggestion is made to varying degrees by Camp, Kopp, Kroom, Finley, and Vyrinen. While my theory in no way depends on the frameworks developed by these authors, it is largely consistent with them. Those who favor those view, these views can interpret my theory as a way of giving details for how and why the choice pragmatically communicates attitudinal facts. A distinctive element is that it captures the explanatory power without committing to much machinery or incurring the theoretical account costs of other accounts. It need not define a slurring perspective as Kant must. It need not deny that slurring assertions have truth values like Hedger. It does not depend on invoking stereotypes, unlike Kroom's account, though it does not rule them out. It does not require some determinate preposition to play the role of implicated content, and it provides a mechanism that ties the offensiveness of slurs to word choice in a way that is systematic, but still able to accommodate fine-grained differences that depends on features of the speakers. In that way, it moves beyond suggestions by Kopp, Finley, and Vyrinen. So where it goes beyond them is one, in specifying how and why the choice warrants offense, and two, accommodating the sort of fine grainedness exhibited by the offensiveness of actual slurs. Because it allows contextual co-occurrence to define signal content, the contrastive choice account is able to explain how the offensiveness of some slurs varies depending on the speaker's apparent group membership. For example, uses of the N-word by white middle-class males are associated with stronger and more aggressively negative attitudes than uses of the same term by upper-class black males, particularly if they happen to be hip-hop artists. This fact neatly explains the asymmetry and offensiveness of the term as used by members of these groups. So you can think about that. What do you assume about someone when they use the N-word? Do you assume something different when you see that this person is a hip-hop artist in a, a song? versus when it is someone who doesn't have a certain other uh, associations. Does that make you think differently about the attitudes of the person? And is it the attitudes of the person who's signaling uh, is what you are taking offense at? Okay, section 4.3, introducing uncertainty, rational offense. Our intuitions about offensiveness are guided not only by what seems to warrant offense, remember that that is what attitudes of the speaker are the sort that we should be offended by, but also by our judgments concerning when hearers would be licensed or reasonable in taking offense. Ignorant slurring is a perfect example, like the person who doesn't know any other word, didn't realize it was a slur. On the one hand, the use of a slur by someone who has no idea that the term is a slur doesn't seem to warrant offense. On the other, we are unwilling to declare that a hearer who takes offense is unreasonable or oversensitive. Maybe we would think that they uh, are unreasonable or oversensitive if they continued taking offense after they realized the speaker didn't know. But when they first hear it, they're perfectly reasonable to take offense. Distinguishing carefully between the conditions for warranted offense and those for rational offense helped make sense of these apparently conflicting intuitions. We earlier said that the rationality of a hearer's offense depends on how proportionate it is given her evidence. In some cases, the offense licensed will be greater than the offense that is in fact warranted. Very informally, a hearer's expected value for W should be set by the severity of the associated contact phi and her confidence that the use of alpha constituted an endorsement of phi. This latter element will be a degreed matter subject to variation based on her relative uncertainty concerning A, whether the choice was forced or free, B, whether the speaker is aware of the association between alpha and phi, and C, whether alpha is in fact associated with phi. Uh, 
greater signal strength will tend to increase the hearer confidence in C and in B, unless she has independent reason to think that the speaker is ignorant. This picture receives support from our actual practices in cases of speaker ignorance. The default assumption is that the speaker is aware of the signaling relations, and consequently use of a slur is taken as grounds for the inference that the speaker endorses the derogation, which licenses offense in the context of utterance. Once we become aware of the speaker's ignorance, we no longer consider the speaker an appropriate target of censure, but neither do we consider ourselves wrong to have been offended. This behavior is easily explained if the speaker's utterance did not in fact warrant offense due to his ignorance, but our reaction was rational, given the default presupposition the speaker is aware of the signal. There's one notable exception to the pattern. When we judge that the speaker's ignorance is inexcusable when she ought to have known, the speaker will be held liable for the offense regardless of her professed ignorance. This is most commonly the case when the speaker involved is a public figure, and is probably motivated by our suspicion that the speaker is not in fact ignorant, but is merely pleading ignorance to escape censure. Section 4.4, limited languages. One might object that contrastive choice cannot explain the offensiveness of all slurs, since slurs may license offense even when there is no alternative expression. To motivate the worry, suppose that there were a language with only one expression, alpha, for a set of people psi, and either everyone in the linguistic community holds size in contempt, or the expression alpha is compositionally derogatory. Compositional means in virtue of the meanings of its parts. We may imagine it translates roughly to swine that should be slaughtered or some other suitably threatening and contemptuous phrase. I think as a matter of fact, this was the case with many traditional groups of people at points in the past where there are communities that didn't communicate with each other but fought wars with each other, and they didn't have a name for the other group other than the people that should be slaughtered or the bad guys or something like that. And whether or not that was in fact the case about various traditional communities, in many cases, the traditional languages have been lost to the sense, uh, to the extent that we don't know of any other words for these groups. And so as a matter of fact, there are certain indigenous communities of the Americas where the terms that we know for these communities are just the terms that had been used by other communities and were, uh, did seem to be derogatory terms. So I believe Anasazi is a term that the Navajos use, and it just literally means the ancient enemies. And so modern anthropologists no longer use the term Anasazi when describing the people who built the Pueblo structures of uh, Northern Arizona and New Mexico. They now just refer to them as the Pueblo people, because even though that's a Spanish word and not an indigenous word, we don't know the word that that community used for themselves. And the only word we know of is the one from the Navajo language, which was in fact inherently a derogatory term. And we don't know if the Navajo had another term for those people that wasn't derogatory. But the claim is imagine a case like that where there's only one word in the language for a group of people and it's a derogatory term. In such a scenario, speakers have no alternative expression for those people, those psi's. So if alpha is an offensive slur, its offensiveness cannot be explained by appeal to a contrastive choice. In these cases, I am inclined to say that it is not the use of the slur per se that grants offense, but rather one of the other contextual factors. The setup provides two excellent candidates. First, one may infer from the fact that the speaker is a member of the community in question that he holds psi's in contempt. This is adequate grounds for offense. 38, though this explains the offensiveness of alpha as used by a community which universally endorses derogatory attitudes towards size, it cannot be generalized to explain the offensiveness of slurs in communities with mixed attitudes. Either in such cases we depend on extra linguistic information, tone, gestures, etc., to distinguish the contemptuous speakers from the non-contemptuous speakers, in which case it's the term itself is not what's underwriting offense, or else an alternative term will emerge. When some significant minority of speakers reject the offensive attitudes, they tend to linguistically innovate, introducing new terms or expressions to achieve reference to size without associating themselves with the dominant attitudes. These new terms are politically correct and function as overtly polite alternatives, strongly signaling the speaker's rejection of the dominant attitude. 
as use of these alternative terms becomes more widespread, the signal content shifts to negatively mark speakers who continue to privilege the original term. Second, it may be that the compositional content of the expression alpha amounts to an explicit endorsement of offensive attitudes, which warrant as much or more offense as using a slur, but without in fact being slurs. Footnote 39. Using a slurring term is of course not the only way to signal that one endorses the derogation or persecution of the target class. There could be a polite racist who scrupulously avoids using slurs while nevertheless endorsing offensive attitudes. He may do so by explicitly saying, I approve of the oppression, persecution, and subjugation of beta simply because they are beta. In such cases, deep offense will be warranted, though it will not have been generated by the use of a slur. In extreme cases, such utterances may be more offensive than if the speaker had simply used the slur. This is as it should be. While the use of a slur is strongly associated with endorsing some of the attitudes in the cluster phi, there is too much noise for any given use to signal which particular attitudes the speaker endorses. Specifically, the use of a slur does not reliably signal that the speaker endorses the most extreme such attitudes. If the use of a slur licenses offense by signaling, with probability less than one, that the speaker endorses offensive attitudes, then the explicit endorsement of the worst such attitudes, effectively raising the probability to one, should be expected to be more immediately offensive. So that is, she's pointing out, sometimes if your word just means calling them the ancient enemies, and calling them the ancient enemies rather than making up some other word signals that you endorse it. And also calling them the ancient enemies may be a way of endorsing the attitude rather than just not talking at all. To eliminate this second explanation, we would need to stipulate that alpha has become idiomatic. That is, ancient enemy is just an idiom. It doesn't actually mean ancient enemy anymore. But doing so makes it much more difficult to hear the term as warranting deep offense. OK, section five, explanatory adequacy. The contrastive choice picture has a great deal of explanatory power, providing a coherent account of each of the major aspects of the offensiveness of slurs. 5.1, offensive autonomy. The degree to which speaker intent is necessary for a use of alpha to constitute an endorsement of phi varies inversely with the strength of the signaling relation between the two. When the signal is strong, like the relationship between an outgroup use of the C word and derogatory attitudes towards women, <coughs> then barring ignorance and forced choice context, use of the term constitutes an endorsement of phi, even absent direct speaker intent. However, when the signal is weak, as is the case for the word chick and disrespect for women, then whether a given use is an endorsement does depend on the speaker's intentions. Offense will be warranted whenever a speaker's use of alpha constitutes an endorsement of the derogation of the target group. For the vast majority of slurs, the signaling relation between choice of the term and endorsing derogation is both strong and well known. Since these signaling relations emerge from population-wide correlations, whether the use of a slur on a particular occasion signals offensive attitudes or not is largely independent of the speaker's actual intent. Consequently, we should expect that the use of a slur will license offense, even when the speaker does not intend derogation. 5.2, perspective dependence. When a speaker chooses to use a slur rather than an available alternative, she signals that she herself endorses the associated derogatory attitudes. This makes sense of our practice of holding speakers themselves responsible for the derogatory attitudes associated with the terms, taking the use to reflect the speaker's own attitudes. 5.3, offensive variation. The variation in offense potential between co-referential slurs, e.g. the n-word versus colored, or f-word versus fairy, can be understood as a variation in associated attitudes and signal strength. And this can be generalized to account for variation between slurs with distinct reference. So notice, I'm not totally sure that colored is usually thought of as a slur the way that the n-word is. But I think she's right that at least this F word and fairy are both slurs for gay people, but one of them is a much milder slur. And this is an interesting point that it's possible to have more and less uh, offensive slurs for the same group of people. 
each slur is associated with a cluster of attitudes varying in degree and severity. Slurs with more extreme or more overwhelmingly negative clusters should be expected to be more offensive than those with mixed or more moderate clusters. Additionally, slurs vary in signal strength. Expressions that are taboo, e.g. the n-word or the f-word, are far less likely to be used innocently than those that are not, colored or fairy. As a result, a use of one of the tabooed terms signals an offensive attitude much more strongly than use of the latter. These two factors, signal strength and severity, combine to create offensive variation. That is, if we think, what are the attitudes associated with the word fairy versus the stronger F word? The attitudes towards gay people that are associated with those seem to be different. And also, given that fairy is not quite as taboo, and in fact is a perfectly ordinary word to use for other purposes, uh, the fact that someone has chosen to use the word fairy is not as strong a signal that they endorse even those attitudes. So it's both milder attitudes and a weaker signal of endorsement. 5.4, embedding failure. Indirect reports. The explanation this account gives for the offensiveness of indirect reports and mere mentions is slightly more involved than the story for direct uses. Indirect reports leave the hearer unable to distinguish whether the current speaker is merely reporting another speaker's use or chose the term himself. In sentence 3a, Bob said he'll fire all the C words. As it occurs in that sentence, the C word is nearly clear, neither clearly mentioned nor clearly used. That is, we don't know whether we are quoting, someone is quoting Bob or if someone is paraphrasing Bob and still choosing to use that word. To convince yourself of this, note the difference in offensiveness between 3a and 3b, in which the slur is clearly mentioned rather than used. Bob said he'll fire all the women, calling them c-words. Confronted with the ambiguous 3a, hearers attempt to discern from context whether the slur occurs as a use or a mention. Aware that 3b is available to speakers who wish to make it clear that the term occurs as a mention, hearers are justified, absent stronger contextual clues, in concluding that this speaker is using the term and therefore signaling an offensive preference. Consequently, a hearer's expected value for w, the warranted offense, is high, so offense is rational. That is, you know 3a is confusing. You know that 3b is not confusing you know whose attitudes are being signaled in 3B. If you chose to use 3 anyway, 3A anyway, then that means you're signaling that you didn't necessarily care to explicitly distinguish yourself from Bob's attitudes. And so a hearer is reasonable in thinking, anyone who wanted to explicitly distinguish themselves could have said 3B. So the fact that they said 3A suggests that they didn't care about doing so. And if they didn't care about doing so, then they probably share the attitude. Maybe it's not as strong an association as just Bob saying it, but, uh, but 3A strongly generates this implication. And I think that sounds about right, that 3A sounds not quite as strong as hearing Bob say it, but it's definitely stronger than 3B. 5.4.2, offensive mentions. In some cases, a speaker may rightly be censured for directly mentioning the slur by uttering 3b instead of applying an easily available circumlocution like 3c. Bob said he'll fire all the women, calling them the c word. There are a few word features of interest in these sorts of cases. First, the offense generated by a mention is invariably less severe than that generated by a use of the same slurring term. Second, Offensive mentions typically occur only in sensitive contexts, public venues, in the presence of children, or contexts where it is not clear whether the speaker intends to derogate. The range of sensitive contexts varies between slurs and is largest for those with dedicated circumlocutions, such as the n-word. Explaining this on the contrast of choice account is fairly straightforward. In mentioning a slurred term, a speaker chooses between two or more expressions to refer to the slur alpha. The quotation name, that is putting the name alpha in quotes, or a description, merely saying a slur or epithet, or in some cases, a dedicated circumlocution, the alpha word. So that is, we can imagine 
the various sentences. Bob said he'll fire all the cunts. Bob said he'll fire all the women calling them a slur. Or Bob said he'll fire all the women calling them cunts. Or Bob said he'll fire all the women calling them the C word. The attitudes associated with using alpha are invariably worse than those associated with mentioning. While uses are associated with hostile, aggressive, and threatening behavior, contextually inappropriate mentions appear to be associated with tamer, though not benign, attitudes, ranging from simple insensitivity to perverse pleasure at saying discomforting words and disregard for the risk of encouraging derogating uses of the slur. The speaker's contrast of choice to use the quotation name rather than an available alternative in a sensitive context signals that the speaker holds some or all of these less severe but still offensive set of attitudes and so warrants offense. So that is, if you know there's another way to mention the word and you choose to use the word anyway, even if you're just quoting someone else, you're showing you don't care about these other aspects, which is definitely not as bad as actually sharing the underlying attitudes, but it's still saying something about what you think. This mechanism is what accounts for the fact that offensiveness is far less severe, but not wholly absent in memo type cases, contra the prediction of a mere mention slash use distinction, where we feel that the author should have issued a blanket prohibition on slurring rather than explicitly mentioning each banned term. Cases like this have instructive implications for the use of slur mentions in academic work. The audience of a paper or presentation is typically controlled and background conditions make it unlikely that the author intends to derogate. So we can expect slur mentions in such contexts to be generally insulated. However, as memo type cases indicate, the mere fact that the slurs are mentioned rather than used does not fully neutralize the offense potential. Scholars are not free to engage in limitless slur mentioning without warranting offense. Insulation extends only so far as plausibly necessary for the legitimate aims of the presentation or paper. Of course, this explanation of offensive mentions only works once a circumlocution is available. On its own, it does nothing to explain why circumlocutions are introduced to the language in the first place. For that, we may appeal to the fact that rational offense can at times exceed warranted offense. Conscientious speakers may seek to insulate themselves from rational offense by removing any ambiguity concerning whether their utterances constitute endorsements, distancing themselves by using various tricks. A slur, the really bad slur, the N-word, the one slur I can't bring myself to say, etc. Most of these are not stable, having no clear referent. But those that are, the C word and the N word are paradigm cases, uh, become terms in their own right, easily available and non-ambiguous ways of referring to their respective slurs. Once these terms have been successfully introduced, the standard story above can explain why using the quotation name in contrast to such an available alternative will license offense. And note that since I am speaking here with the text visible on the screen, I have more circumlocutions available than someone who is just writing the paper. If in writing the paper, she never met, uh, explicitly wrote out any of these terms and just called them the N word, the C word, the F word, the CH word, and some of those uses wouldn't be quite so clear. Whereas for me, those words are on the page, so I can usually get by without saying them explicitly, and my circumlocution will be understood. So that means any remaining uses of the term by me or quotations of the term by me are legitimately thought to have higher uh, offensiveness than the use by the author of the paper. Section 5.5, insulation. Finally, the account gives clear conditions for successful insulation accurately predicting when mentions and uses of slurs will not license rational offense. When a speaker's selection of a slur is forced, as it is in direct quotation or dictionary type mentions, the occurrence is insulated. That is, if the lawyer asks you, tell us precisely what words you said, or if you're writing the dictionary and you need to write the definition of this word, you really do have to use the word. And so in that case, the fact that you use the word doesn't indicate that you chose this word over some alternative because you needed to mention this word. 
This much is easily explained by nearly every theory. But where the pragmatic story earns its keep is in permitting the possibility of insulated uses when they occur in voice choice context. The interesting question then is whether there are any such uses to be explained. That is, it's not just cases where someone's quoting it or talking about the word. There are some cases in which you can actually use the word uh, that might be less offensive. And this is what she's going to talk about in section six, talking about its uses in a film. Extensions to actual offense patterns. Up to this point, the project has been mostly a normative one, developing an account of the conditions under which it is rational or warranted to take offense at the occurrence of a slurring term. But the account can do more tricks than that. It allows us to predict patterns of actual offense generation insofar as the offense is rational. The accuracy of these predictions is striking confirmation of the view. That is, a normative theory is one that says how we should think about things. A descriptive theory is saying how we do. And she says her theory does both. And we can evaluate if we think that her theory is doing a good job of predicting the actual offense people have taken. 6.1, art uses, an exceptional case. Asked about the acceptability of uses of the N-word, Dr. David Coven, chair of the Sacramento Area Black Caucus, answered that whether the use of the word is acceptable or not depends on the context. If it were from a quote of historical records or literary work or a theatrical context, that's different. If it were simply plain speech, it wouldn't be acceptable. The successful insulation of offense in historical records can be explained as direct quotation, but literary and theatrical works present more of a puzzle. Touré has an excellent discussion of the permissible uses of slurs in performance, which gestures at both why an artist may genuinely need to use the slur and how a performance can justify such a use. He writes, those deep emotions that the N-word taps into are precisely why I defend the right for artists on stage to use the N-word. By stage, I mean movies, TV, theater, stand-up comedy, visual art, and music. The stage is a special place when normal human laws and customs apply differently. Many whites have used the N-word on stage to this extent, to put the N-word in the mouth of racists and losers and thus remind the audience that racism is dumb and deplorable. Slurring terms that occur on stage in Touré's sense, called these art uses, have a particularly interesting pattern of actual offense generation. If the artist or performer is successful and the use is well taken, the artist is not censured for using the slur. However, the term is not inert. The use is accepted precisely because it evokes strong emotional response. Since art uses are still emotionally active as slurring terms, we cannot explain their acceptability by supposing that in art uses, slurs are really only mentioned by the artist. The slurs have their normal offense generation patterns within the fiction, but do not generate offense or censure beyond it. The actor, writer, producer, etc., are held innocent when art uses are deemed acceptable locating the insulation. One natural thought is that in such cases, we hold responsible and censure the character while ignoring the artist on the grounds that she is merely the mouthpiece. This is too simplistic. While we certainly do typically react negatively to the character using the slur, we do not ignore the artist. There are instances, particularly when slurs come from the mouth of children characters, that her ire is directed at the society around the character rather than at the speaking character herself. Scout serves this function in To Kill a Mockingbird, as does a nephew of Pee Wee Reese in the movie 42. In cases where the use is not well taken, it is the artist whom we censure, not merely the character or artwork. Those who found Quentin Tarantino's use of the N-word excessive in Pulp Fiction or Jackie Brown directed their censure at Tarantino himself rather than at the actors who spoke the slurs or at the characters portrayed. Similarly, when a comedian's use of a slur even while portraying a racist character is not well received, audience anger is directed at the comedian. It appears then that when an art use ca causes actual offense outside the fiction, censure is directed at the person who decided that the slur should be used. And only when he happens to be the same person does it attach to the speaker. That is, if a stand-up comic is both writing his lines and saying them, then the comic gets the offense. But when Quentin Tarantino is writing the script and, uh, John Travolta or uh, Samuel L. Jackson is saying the word, we hold Tarantino responsible, not Travolta or Jackson. 
in no case is umbrage for an unacceptable use limited to only the character who used the slur within the fiction. So it will not do to explain the insulation of these terms by appeal to displacement alone. If instead we gloss art uses as a special case of forced choice context, the contrast of choice account predicts a pattern for rational offense that is a remarkably close match for the observed pattern of actual offense. It predicts that art uses will be insulated when two conditions are meant and license offense otherwise. One, the use of the slur is required for the purposes of the artwork. And two, these purposes are good enough to justify the slur. Histories, social critiques, and works that function to improve the social position of the group targeted by the slurs are the most likely to satisfy both conditions, and so should be expected to be successfully insulated more reliably than art uses which occur in comedies or as the punchline in a stand-up routine. Imagine a sitcom using uh, slur words and think about how much, what would need to be the case for you to feel that the sitcom was appropriately doing it. Importantly, the forced choice justification only protects the speaker from offense if we judge that the slur really is required and justified by the purpose of the performance. If the use is excessive or not adequately motivated, then the performer's decision is less properly characterized as a forced choice, at which point the contrast of preference to use a slurring term warrants offense once more. 6.1.2, conditions of acceptability. A cursory glance at the reception of recent movies featuring slurring terms confirms these predictions. Controversy over the acceptability of an art use tends to center on whether the artistic purpose was adequately justifying, rather than on whether it can ever be acceptable to token the offensive terms. Uh, footnote 44 says, there have of course been some attempts to ban the N-word from the music industry, condemning that the term should simply never be used. The following poem by performance artist Dean Atta is a prime example of the sort of appeal that is made. Rappers, when you use the N-word, remember, that's one of the last words Stephen Lawrence heard. So don't tell me it's a reclaimed word. I am nobody's N-word. So please let my ancestors rest in peace. It is important to note, one, the authors of the movement make no negative comments about the uses in critical works. And in this case, the appeal even features an art use of the term. And two, the justification offered is that it is impossible to reclaim the word and hence unacceptable to embrace and use the word to refer. This discussion is then more properly about direct primary uses rather than the acceptability of indirect art uses. So she's saying, in most cases, the discussion isn't about completely banning the word, it's about how acceptable was this use of the word. Two films are of particular interest in this respect, Django Unchained and 42. Both follow the struggles of an ultimately victorious African-American protagonist supported and guided by an older white male. Quentin Tarantino's Django adopts the comic tone of a spaghetti Western. That's a genre of American Westerns filmed by Italian directors and uh, cinematographers, including things like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. While Brian Hegelin's 42 is a tribute to Jackie Robinson and verges on hagiography. Jackie Robinson, of course, being the first black player to play in the Major League Baseball, and hagiography being a historical genre, meaning the lives of saints, and many traditional medieval lives of saints just completely sanitized the story of the saint's life and made it out like they were good in every way and everyone was bad to them and bad in every way. I don't think that 42 actually does that, but she's saying she, it verges on that. Tarantino's 110 uses of the N-word are not driven by an attempt to accurately depict the speech patterns of the era. They function solely to shape the emotional impact of the script. Footnote 45. The film's indifference concerning accurately representing the speech of the period is evidenced by the use of fuck and its cognates in the film. Though the film is set in 1858, the term did not acquire its modern status as an all-purpose expletive until at least 1901. So she's pointing out, Quentin Tarantino wasn't using that word because he wants to accurately represent 1858 speech. He's just doing it because that word is emotional. Many felt that this, coupled with the sheer quantity of slurs and the jocular tone of the movie, signaled a flippancy concerning the slur that is disrespectful 
and not outweighed by the movie's violent depiction and narrative condemnation of slavery. We may not fully agree with that, but it's something to note in contrast to what she says is going on with 42. 42 is remarkable for how little discussion of slurs it generated, particularly since it was released at the height of the controversy over the slur-ridden Django. Higlin's uses can plausibly be said to result from historical necessity. Set in 1947, the film includes 46 occurrences of the N-word, 30 of them in a single scene which reenacts Ben Chapman's heckling of Robinson. Though Alan Tudyk, playing Chapman, reports that the scene was difficult to film, it was widely agreed that softening the slurs would sugarcoat history and belittle Robinson's struggle. Apparently, the MPAA and the general public agreed. The movie received only a PG-13 rating and had the most successful opening weekend of any baseball movie to date. The difference in acceptability of the uses between the two films tracks the two conditions predicted by the contrast of choice account. The use of the slurs is crucial to 42's celebration of Jackie Robinson's historic triumph over racism, whereas it is unclear both whether the slurs were necessary to achieve the goals of Django Unchained and whether those goals were sufficient to justify the slurs. Of course, analysis of the reception of these films is complicated by the many respects in which the movies differ tone, historical approach, narrative style, and Tarantino's personal history with the N-word. Spike Lee's criticisms of Tarantino's work allude to this, as does Louis C.K.'s podcast discussion of Tarantino wanting an N-word pass. And uh, I think this paper was written before Louis C.K. came under his own criticism. 6.2, accounting for variation in offendedness, offendedness. By tying the rationality of offense to a hearer's evidence, the contrast of choice account yields an elegant explanation of faultless interpersonal threshold variance for offense at the use of slurs. It predicts that if rational, a hearer's level of offense should vary with her confidence that the use of a term signals the speaker's endorsement of offensive attitudes. If a given hearer has comparatively less confidence than her peers in the signaling relation, her tolerance for slurs should be higher than is typical among her peers since she does not perceive them as warranting offense as reliably as do her peers. Her expected value for W is low as compared to her peer group. That is, if you have different people and they believe different things about how strongly correlated the slurs are with offensive attitudes, the people who think they're more correlated should take more offense, and the people who think they're less correlated should take less offense. And regardless of how correlated you think they are, I think we can all agree that does seem to be a good explanation of who is taking how much offense at which uses. Reclamation, amelioration, and transference. This model also provides a nice explanation of cases when the level of offense that is rational to take at an occurrence of a given expression changes over time. There are three ways that this occurs, by reclamation, by disuse, and by transference of offensiveness from one term to another. 6.3.1, reclamation. Successful reclamation works by undermining the signal strength of the slurring term. Initially, a group of speakers who reject the derogation of the target use the slur defiantly. As this group grows, the likelihood that the user of the term holds the derogatory attitudes falls, causing the information in the signal to degrade. Reclamation is successful when the signal has been so diluted as to carry no information. The term is at least as likely to be used positively as it is to be used by those who hold objectionable attitudes. At that point, it is possible to exhibit a contrastive preference for the term without by default licensing rational offense. That's not to say that a reclaimed slurring term can be used by just anyone or in just any context without warranting offense. Recall that earlier we said that speaker intent is relevant when the signal strength is weak. In the mouths of homophobes, use of the reclaimed term queer can still warrant deep offense. This is because the intent to use the word to endorse homophobic attitudes is contextually clear, and a use of a slur warrants offense precisely when it constitutes an endorsement of such derogatory attitudes. 6.3.2, amelioration and transference. The contrast of choice mechanism also yields a natural account of amelioration, or the diminished offensiveness of archaic slurs. Even after we are informed that Bosch is a derogatory term, expressing contempt for Germans and implying that they are all cruel, 
it is hard to feel the offensiveness of the term. Footnote 49, a number of authors in the slurs literature, Camp, Jesh, and Hedger, have cited this phenomenon as the reason why, despite their toxicity, discussions of offensiveness must use active slurs as examples rather than the tamer archaic slurs. I think several early papers in this literature talked about Bosch as the example because the authors wanted to avoid using active slurs, but as a result, they happen to be holding the terms at more of a distance and not quite analyzing the full force of the terms. This is difficult to explain if the offense is semantically encoded in the term, since it is not clear that the semantic meaning of the term has changed at all. Although you might think some accounts suggest that the semantic meaning can change if the use patterns change. What has changed, however, is the frequency of use. Bosch hasn't been reclaimed, it has simply fallen into disuse. If the offensiveness of a slur arises from a signaling relation between the slur and derogatory attitudes, then we should expect that if the term falls into disuse, the signal will degrade, and with it, the offensiveness of the term will fade. And this is because signal content is reinforced through use. As use frequency decreases, the signal is reinforced less often, with the result that over time, the signal strength falls below the minimum threshold for retention and is forgotten. Alexander, Skirms, and Zabel offer a basic model of this phenomena. Alexander discusses a more nuanced account that incorporates past discounting to more adequately model natural languages by allowing for semantic drift. Either model predicts that signal content will fade as the term falls into disuse. And note that Alexander, Skirms, and Zabel are working just as much in biological signals as they are in linguistic signals. So they're thinking cases where monkeys use certain sounds to signal different types of predators or peacocks use their tails to signal health. In those cases, of course, the peacock tail is always present in the most healthy birds. And so it becomes a strong signal, whereas a signal that is used much less often is going to fade out of its evolutionary significance. Transference is a closely related case occurring when the offensiveness of one slur transfers over to a co-referential slur, leaving the first expression muted or toothless. We can understand transference as a two-part phenomenon, fading of the original term and an attendant shift in social perception that the associations of the first term actually belong to the second. This appears to be with what occurred with the terms CH word and coolie in the United States. As coolie faded, the CH word gained prominence as the preferred slur against Chinese individuals. Speakers subsequently assumed that the CH word had always been the dominant slur and are now surprised to learn that it was coolie rather than the CH word that featured prominently in the historic oppression of Chinese nationals in the Americas. The coolie trade in the mid 1800s referred to the practice of shipping, often abducting, as they might say, Shanghaiing Chinese nationals to the Americas and indenturing them to years of hard labor. The term also featured prominently in racist US political rhetoric surrounding the implementation of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, outlawing the immigration of Chinese laborers into the United States. Despite all of this, the fact that coolie was the word that was used in those times, it is the CH word rather than coolie that carries these associations in the present. Conclusion. Invoking the signaling relations involved in contrast of choice fully accounts for all the major features of offense generation and gets the right results in some less well-known cases. Utilizing the account does not require postulating any novel pragmatic mechanisms since signaling relations are well accepted and prolific. And it allows the explanation of the offensiveness of slurs to parallel our best accounts of the offensiveness of impolite and rude behavior. Since this explanation is compatible with and therefore available to most theories of the semantics of slurs, absent a compelling reason, we should not evaluate theories based on their ability to give a purely semantic explanation of offensiveness. Instead, perhaps we should focus on accounting for or explaining away other central characteristics, including how the terms came to be associated with derogation in the first place, their conditions of application, relation to their neutral counterparts, and the connection between slurs and stereotypes of the target group. So she's saying a semantic account like that given by Chris Hom or others should deal with these things, but the offensiveness can come from the pragmatics. And maybe once you've got the semantic account with these things, that can explain how the signaling association gets developed, which then leads to the pragmatics. But we don't necessarily have to have 
Palm's account of the semantics in order for Bollinger's account of the pragmatics to take effect. 